This segment of our course on reciprocating compressors deals with double-acting compressors. These are the more common type of reciprocating compressors now in use at most plants. And as you can see, they appear to be considerably more complicated. Double-acting compressors are different from single-acting compressors in that the double-acting type compresses the air, or gas, on each stroke, both the backstroke and the forward stroke. In other words, the double-acting compressor has two compression strokes per revolution, where the single-acting compressor had only one per revolution. Let's start at the crankshaft, as we did with the single-acting compressor. As with the simpler machine, this compressor may be driven by a gas engine, diesel engine, electric motor, or steam turbine. The driver is not important, as far as this course is concerned, except for the fact that it turns the crankshaft. The crankshaft is connected to the connecting rod with a crank pin. The other end of the connecting rod is fastened to the crosshead. And the crosshead is connected to the piston rod. Let's concentrate on the crosshead for a moment and show you exactly what it does. As we said, the crosshead connects the connecting rod to the piston rod. Its function is to convert the rotary action of the crankshaft into the reciprocating action of the piston rod. It does this by sliding back and forth in the crosshead guides, shown here. The actual contact between the two is made between the crosshead shoes, mounted on the crosshead, and the crosshead guides. The connecting rod is fastened to the crosshead with this crosshead pin. Again, the crankshaft is fastened to the connecting rod with the crank pin. The other end of the connecting rod is mounted on the crosshead, linking it to the piston rod. The crosshead shoes, mounted on the crosshead, slide back and forth inside the crosshead guides. Remember, the crosshead converts the rotary motion of the crankshaft and connecting rod to reciprocating motion of the piston rod. The faces of the crosshead are also called the slippers at some plants because they slip back and forth in the crosshead guides. Now that we've covered the compressor through one end of the piston rod, let's move farther into the compressor. The piston rod extends through the distance piece before connecting to the piston in the cylinder. The distance piece is meant to create a distance between the cylinder and the crankshaft end of the compressor. and provide access to the wiper and packing ring glands. As you can see, it has oil wiper rings on one side of it. And packing rings on the other. The distance piece collects the oil leakage from the crank end of the compressor and cylinder packing oil and compressed gas leakage from the cylinder end. The two are then drained out of the compressor. If there was no distance piece, crankcase oil could leak into the cylinder or compressed gas into the crankshaft end of the compressor. The distance piece solves these problems by maintaining a distance and draining point between the two. It also provides access to the packing and wiper rings. 
The piston rod has now passed through the distance piece and is fastened securely to the piston in the cylinder. Remember, the piston rod is mounted in the crosshead, passes through the distance piece, into the cylinder, and fastens to the piston. The piston then slides back and forth inside the cylinder with a reciprocating motion. Now let's look at the cylinder more closely. To begin with, this is the crank end or frame end of the cylinder. And this is the head end. Remember this, since we will refer to it frequently in the next few minutes. As you can see, there are four separate valves on this cylinder. These are the suction valves. And these are the discharge valves. This does not mean that the suction valves will always be on top and the discharge valves on the bottom. We are just using this graphic example as an illustration. Since these are the suction valves, they open into the suction gas jacket, the same jacket for both valves. This suction line inlet allows the gas or air to be sucked into the suction gas jacket and then through the suction valves. On the other side of the cylinder are the discharge valves, which open into the discharge gas jacket. The discharge gas jacket then feeds compressed air or gas into the discharge line here. Now let's see how this double acting compressor works. As the piston starts from the left, or head end of the cylinder, it moves toward the crank end, like this. This opens this suction valve and pulls air into the head end of the cylinder. However, at the same time, the piston is compressing air on the other side or crank end. The compressed air then forces the discharge valve open and forces air into the discharge gas jacket and out of the compressor. Let's look at both actions simultaneously since they are happening at the same time. The piston is moving from the head end to the crank end. This action opens the suction valve on the head end, pulling air into the compressor. At the same time, the other side of the piston is compressing air as it moves toward the crank end, opening the discharge valve and forcing the compressed air out. When the piston reaches the crank end of the cylinder, the suction valve on the head end and the discharge valve on the crank end both close. The piston is now ready to begin the second half of the revolution of the crankshaft. As it moves back toward the head end, this suction valve on the crank end opens, pulling air into the cylinder behind the piston. At the same time, the discharge valve on the head end opens, and air is forced into the discharge gas jacket. This action continues until the piston reaches the position it started from, completing the revolution of the crankshaft. Now you can see why this is called a double acting compressor. It has two compression strokes for each revolution, compressing air or gas on both the forward stroke and the back stroke. Since a double acting compressor is considerably more efficient than a single acting type, they are in much wider use in most plants. You will concentrate on the model you have just seen throughout the remainder of this course on reciprocating compressors.
We have some questions for you now on double acting reciprocating compressors. Turn to exercise number two in your workbook.